Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast. Critical power backup, standby, and emergency power in mission critical facilities. Sponsored by ASCO Power Technologies, I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media. Here are, is the list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. We'll cover these in today's presentation. Now let's meet today's presenters, Kenneth Katsmita and Scott Kessler. Kenneth Katsmita is an engineering design principal for Jacobs in Philadelphia. He holds the role of an engineering manager for the mission critical sector at Jacobs. For more than 20 years, Ken has built a catalog of more than 700,000 square feet of completed data center and commissioning work for many commercial, federal, and municipal clients. He is responsible for the engineering, design, and commissioning of power distribution systems for mission-critical facilities. His expertise has given him the opportunity to publish articles on mission-critical power distribution systems for consulting specifying engineer, and he is currently a member of its editorial advisory board. Scott Kessler is a principal for Canon Design. He leads the firm-wide engineering practice from an operations and business perspective and focused on design excellence, quality, and performance Scott is able to drive powerful collabor collaboration with clients that helps achieve successful project outcomes. A thought leader and innovator, he recognizes that engineers need to engage with projects from their outset to ensure every concept, detail, and plan is connected and focused on client's objectives. Thank you, Kenneth and Scott, for joining us today in Kenneth. You're our first speaker, so the floor is all yours. Thanks, Jack. So how important is a standby power system in a mission critical facility? So basically, if you're a facility operator, the power goes out, the 911 facility, maybe you're a doctor in operation, that 10 seconds or less while you're sitting there waiting for that power to come on, that basically, that's the importance of that critical standby power system. It becomes the most power, you know, most important system uh, in that facility. So basically, during a utility power outage, uh, the mission critical facility, they rely on that generator and that standby power system to keep the facility operating. Uh, an emergency system or maybe a legally required generator are really designed to safely evacuate people, maybe prevent a hazard uh, by keeping portions of the system operating for certain periods of time. We're in a standby system for mission critical. It's really designed to keep the critical components, maybe the entire system, operating for that complete extent of the outage. It's not just a short period of time. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. We want to talk about the importance of mission critical standby power systems, some of the requirements, some of the codes, and just kind of give you an overall picture of, of what it means and how to design a system. So a mission critical system is basically a system that is essential to the survival of a business or organization. So when a mission critical system fails or it's interrupted, the operations are significantly impacted. And there's basically three components to a mission critical system. One is availability. That system must function when required. It's a 24 by 7 system. The second is reliability. The system must not fail. And if it does fail, it has to have a way to respond and recover quickly and get back to operating. And then the third is security. The system must be pr protected against attacks, whether it's a human attack, uh, a human error, or even a naturally disaster. Um, it has to be able to protect it so that it keeps operating. Now there's two basic types of mission critical facilities. The first is basically a private facility. Um, it's basically where the attributes of that facility are divine, defined by the business and the business case uh, to keep the business continuity running. The other is more public safety type of mission critical. This is where the attributes are defined by code. Uh, these are actually governed by the AHJ or the authority having jurisdiction. So the private mission critical facility, um, you're looking at a facility where the levels of availability, the reliability are all dictated by the business case. How much level of risk are we allowed to accept? Uh, is there downtime for maintenance? 
what's the required degree of redundancy required to keep that facility running, and how much protection against for failures. So it's basically you're designing your system based on what you think your business case is. Different types of these facilities uh, include maybe university operation centers. Uh, these are facilities where you may have some downtime during Christmas break over the summer, so you might have less um, maintainability requirements. Uh, there's enterprise data centers, uh, financial and trading facilities where you have very little downtime. Um, you might be able to work on some systems over a green zone on the weekend, but you've got to get back up and running before Monday. They don't come down, but they allow some opportunities for you to work. Um, Co-location data centers. Um, where your whole business enterprise is based on revenue, how much capital do you want to spend up front for how much reliability are you providing to your clients? And then cloud computing centers, uh, same thing, how much reliability and redundancy do you want to build into your system? Now there's two standards uh, that are basically used for um, standby systems for mission critical, um, public, or I mean private, uh, that's ANSI TIA 942 standard, and then the Uptime Institute guidelines. Now both of these have, one has a tier, one has levels or classifications which have been established. Um, they're basically to be used as a guide to assist you in designing the topology and the system that will deliver the level of required redundancy and reliability that you want. Um, and they're basically breaking up into, like I said, tier classifications. Uh, a tier one is a basic system, maybe a generator, UPS, uh, not a lot of redundancy, not a lot of bypass. Uh, tier 2 is where you start implementing redundant components, maybe an N plus 1 generator, mm -hmm. N plus 1 EPS. A Tier 3 is basically to set up with a lot of bypass systems, so you could put a system in bypass while you ma maintain that system. It's live. You don't have to shut the system down. And then Tier 4 is more fault tolerant. That's where you start to see uh, fully redundant systems, a 2 end system where if you have a fault, the system swings to another system and it still maintains its uh, availability and reliability during the failure. The other type of mission critical facility is a public. It's most public safety facilities. These are facilities where the levels of availability and reliability um, are required by code to protect the public safety, protect public health, and national security. They're basically defined by code, and then they're actually governed by um, the authority having jurisdiction. Some examples of these facilities might be uh, an emergency call center, a 911 center, emergency management center, police fire stations, hospitals, uh, any government facility involved with national security, and then any financial facilities um, like maybe the stock market that are involved with national economic security. For these types of facilities, uh, NEC Article 708, it's Critical Operations Power System, otherwise known as COPS. Um, this code was basically set up to address home line security issues for mission critical facilities. Um, where critical operation systems are installed, uh, these are basically vital facilities that if we're incapacitated or shut down would disrupt national security, the economy, affect public health or public safety. Um, and this code basically provides requirements for the installation, operation, and control, maintenance of any electrical system serving critical areas and anything that must remain operational during a natural or human disaster. Um, some of the requirements for standby power in Article 708, um, you need to provide alternate power supply, so a generator of some sort, um, or battery systems. Uh, the alternate power supply shall have on-site fuel capacity for 72 hours. So basically they do not allow the generator to be dependent on natural gas or some kind of gas fuel. Um, the idea is that it has to be completely isolated, independent of any exterior sources. Um, you don't want the gas line to be going down and then taking down the system. Any standby power has to have redundant equipment um, at a minimum, or at least at a minimum to connect to a roll-up piece of equipment. So if you have to do maintenance, you can roll up and bring in another piece of equipment to make sure you have uh, uh, standby power supply during that maintenance time. All the equipment must be located above the 100-year floodplain. Um, with COPS, any system wiring that has to be independent of utility wire. Um, so if you run wire common with the generator, common with other utility, you have to make sure it's separate. Any feeders have to protect if fire protected. Um, it must be selectively coordinated. You do need to have a documented commissioning plan that you were, it was commissioned and tested, and then they want to make sure you have a documented maintenance plan that you're going to maintain the system once it's in operation. 
With that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. He's going to talk a little bit about another type of public facility, uh, hospitals. Thanks, Ken. I'm switching gears a little bit into the healthcare um, area of the, of the practice. Um, similar to many of the critical operation centers that Ken just described, healthcare facilities also require a robust backup and standby power system. Um, many of the same principles that apply to those types of mission critical facilities also apply to hospitals, albeit through different codes and standards, which we're going to cover here in a, in a second. So the most prominent ones would be the National Electrical Code, obviously, um, Article 517, which is specific to healthcare facilities, and FPA 99, which is the healthcare facility code itself, uh, NFPA 101, Life Safety Code, and NFPA 110, the standard for emergency and standby, standby power systems. There's been a lot of efforts over the last several iterations uh, or code cycles through these various uh, codes themselves to try to bring uh, alignment between the codes. The technical committees that have been working on these um, have realized over the course of the years that there was contradictory information. So in the past couple of code cycles, there's been quite a bit of alignment, uh, particularly between Article 517, uh, NFPA 99, and, and NFPA 110. Some additional codes and standards that we, we often face in designing hospital buildings, obviously the most prominent, I think, is the Facility Guidelines Institute. Uh, this was formerly the document issued by the AIA uh, that's since gone over to the FGI. Uh, this is a broad-based document that covers uh, all types of healthcare facilities, not just hospitals. State and local codes and authorities having jurisdictions oftentimes, many times, have their own codes and, and requirements as well. Some of the more prominent uh, ones that probably many in the audience have heard are in, in California. We have Oshpod, uh, Florida, there's ACA, but uh, many of the states have some some semblance of adoption of codes that specifically uh, apply to healthcare facilities. Additionally, there's uh, the Joint Commission and the Centers for Medicare and, and Medicaid Services. Um, what's vital here is that these two organizations oversee um, and inspect, uh, I shouldn't say oversee, but they inspect the facilities for um, compliance with any number of standards and codes. Uh, it's critical for hospitals to meet their requirements to make sure that they're getting reimbursement uh, from the government properly. Some definitions, I'm going to cover just two key ones, uh, healthcare facilities. Um, this is the code, or, or excuse me, the text directly out of the code, the NEC. Uh, healthcare facilities can constitute any number of different kinds of facilities from medical or dental offices to hospitals. Each of them have their different requirements and levels of potential risk and required system design uh, sophistication or level of sophistication. It's key to keep in mind that there is a difference between healthcare facilities and healthcare occupancy type. Uh, healthcare occupancies can include uh, ambulatory facilities. Um, they're considered a healthcare facility as well, but uh, within a healthcare facility, you, um, uh, or excuse me, not all healthcare facilities are considered healthcare occupancies. A hospital, for instance, might have several different types of occupancies within it. Uh, obviously, the healthcare component, but possibly an assembly environment, business environment, ambulatory storage, things of that nature. And then the other definition I want to cover briefly is the central electrical system. That's obviously what we're talking about. Um, uh, here today and uh, how that relates to the design of the overall electrical system. In other types of facilities, the primary purpose of the emergency system is for life safety and for building evacuation. In hospitals, though, these systems are really necessary for preservation of life, including maintaining ongoing operations even in the event of a prolonged utility outage. So what does that mean as we're looking at uh, system design and what are the things that we consider when we're designing the electrical distribution system for a hospital. So the redundancy and the reliability of the electrical distribution system starts not just with the emergency side, but really with the normal service. This too can be made as reliable as possible, and oftentimes this is done through using multiple sources from the utility or service provider. Uh, this could be multiple feeders coming from different substations. 
different feeder pathways to the site of the facility in different arrangements uh, within the distribution of the utility or the end user that allows for flexibility, for growth, for routine maintenance, um, and in testing and eventually replacement. That's often something that's overlooked in the process. And the longer you work in the uh, in the industry, you eventually have to deal with replacing of equipment, and you want to make sure you've taken that into consideration um, as you go through the process as well. The entire system, both normal and emergency, shall be designed to minimize interruptions. Um, obviously, we want to keep power to the most critical components of both of these facility types. Um, many hospitals are oftentimes looking for what I'll call near normal operating conditions in some parts of their facility, so they really don't experience any type of, of impact or minimal impact when they're operating on generator power. So there's many considerations to be taken into account when designing the emergency electrical system. Uh, these include and are not limited by the things that I see that I've uh, in indicated on the slide here. So, starting with uh, critical versus general care occupancy or room types, the critical care is ca our category one versus the category two in the general care. And really, the difference here is the level of risk that's involved to the patient or the occupant within the space. So, in a general care area, the space is where the failure of the equipment or system is likely to cause potentially a minor injury to the patients or other occupancy occupants within the space, whereas a critical care space is one where the failure of equipment or systems is likely to cause major injury or potentially even death uh, to the patients, staff, or visitors in these areas. So these are typically spaces where the patients are intended to be subjected to invasive procedures um, and or connected to life support equipment. So obviously, in a critical care area, we're required to have a type one uh, emergency electrical system or central electrical system. These are comprised of branches. Um, the three that are required by code are the life safety branch. Uh, this is generally uh, serving loads such as exit and egress lighting, your med gas alarms, elevator cab lighting, uh, generator loads, so like your battery charger, fuel pumps, ventilation systems that serve the generator load. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that the life safety branch also needs to meet the requirements of Article 700 in the NEC, uh, except as how it's amended by Article 517, the, specifically to healthcare environments. The other two branches uh, that are required by code are the critical care branch. This serves primarily patient care uh, focused loads oftentimes imaging equipment, uh, receptacles, small equipment that's required for patient care. The equipment branch is predominantly or primarily three-phase mechanical loads, uh, so air handling units, um, boilers or heating systems, uh, medical gas pumps, uh, vacuum pumps, things of that nature would fall into the equipment branch. And then Oftentimes, you'll see optional loads as well. So these are loads that are not required by code, but something that the facility or the hospital would want to see on emergency power backed up. Uh, these might be loads like cooling or chilling loads, uh, chiller loads, excuse me. Um, oftentimes, maybe you'll see refrigerators or freezers in a dietary area to preserve the food uh, if there's a prolonged outage. So those things that are not required by code would fall onto, under the optional load category. So other things we want to consider when we're looking in, in this is the location. So you want the components of the system to be located in an area that's not going to be um, disrupted uh, or impacted by natural disasters or natural forces, as Ken alluded to earlier. You want to try and maintain physical separation uh, between different pieces of equipment. Again, so if you've got a catastrophic failure of a piece of gear, it's not going to take down other components of the system. You're also going to want to look at physical separation of feeders um, and circuits as you distribute throughout the facility. Looking at the capacity and the rating of the system, the systems need to have obviously adequate capacity to serve all of the required essential electrical loads. Um, and you want that to be sized so that they can all be operated simultaneously. Um, if you have optional loads, you'll want to take that into consideration as well and look how that might or impact or may not impact the size of your system and your generator requirements. Um, 
Other considerations is possibly use for peak shaving, although there are specific requirements from a code perspective and constraints on that. Um, and then as you're looking at all these different kind of loads, you want to start taking into consideration the priorities. So obviously your highest priority are your loads uh, that are required by code. The optional loads are things that are nice to have all fall towards the bottom of the list. So as you're looking for um, an overall system design, and oftentimes when you parallel generators, you want to plan for the uh, unlikely event, hopefully, uh, that one of the generators would fail, uh, either during operation or during startup. And how do you handle uh, that from a, from a system perspective and a design perspective? And you need to prioritize those loads, and you do that, as you, obviously, as you go through the design process. And we'll touch on that a little bit here in a couple more slides as to uh, common ways of handling that. From a distribution standpoint, I mentioned earlier, you want to have multiple paths. Uh, again, physical separation is a great thing to be able to uh, help support and ensure some sort of longevity and robustness into the system. Uh, and then the last area I want to touch briefly about is on transfer switches. The number of transfer switches that you'd have in your system is, is going to be impactful by the amount of load, the type of loads that you're serving, and the arrangement or the disbursement across your facility. Generally, there's three types of transfer switches. You've got your automatic, your manual, and delayed. Um, and oftentimes, they're used to manage uh, the generator system loading. Uh, it's a very common way of handling load shedding and load control. And obviously, you can improve your overall system reliability and robustness by increasing the number of transfer switches. And, taking into consideration what loads they serve and, again, the priorities that those loads uh, those have in ranking in relationship to others within the facility. Similar to the COMPS facilities discussed by Ken earlier, the healthcare facilities require an electrical system to be designed with selective coordination. Uh, the key here is to isolate the faults and maintain operations to the balance of the facility. So if you do have an issue, you want to keep it as local as you can to the to the uh, to the problem at hand so you're going to see some uh, get some images here some typical slides or typical uh, distributions of some slides so here are the normal power redundancy you're looking at dual sources i mentioned you want to start at that side of the equation uh, ensure that you've got um, reliability there through dual sources a main time main arrangement uh, ideally even with automatic transfer capabilities on that side again with multiple transfer switches. If you have a typical or a multiple generator distribution system, same components generally as the one we just showed, uh, the difference being really on the generator side. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see this because of scale or capacity that's required to serve the load. Um, multiple generators are parallel together. And in this case, obviously, you need to implement a load shed or load control system. And I've got an example here of a transfer switch schedule. Um, I think the key things to take away here are the priority designation that I had indicated um, previously. Um, the code required loads are obviously priority one. The optional loads, equipment branch loads, start to become different prioritizations. And what you're trying to do here is really to stagger the loads as they're added to the system. So your priority one loads by code have to be online within 10 seconds. Um, the other loads you would add so that you maintain uh, the system and is ensure that there's capacity there to add these additional loads, particularly when you're looking at a multiple generator installation. Uh, I mentioned earlier that if you lost a generator, for instance, you would want to start then at the lower priorities and you begin to shed those to a point where you can ensure continuity of the system and maintain uh, backup power for the most critical loads of the critical functions within, within your facility. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ken. Thanks, Scott. So I'm going to talk a little bit about data centers. Um, like Scott had mentioned, uh, with hospitals, you, a lot of times you see where the hosp whole hospital wants to be normal operation. That's pretty much what a data center. A data center is a large load. It has, you know, there's not a whole lot of shedding capacity. It's pretty much all mission critical. So you're looking at basically keeping that entire facility up and running. Um, they have a low tolerance for risk. 
Um, there's not a lot of downtime or no downtime, high level of reliability. So a lot of times with the data center, you'll see uh, redundant components within the standby power system. So you'll see M plus one generators, M plus two, maybe in a full two end system. Um, these are usually basically where they fall in is a tier three, tier four, um, what they call tier three plus in some sources, where you want to meet the requirements of tier three, but you can't, you know, the expense to get to a complete tier four is too high, so they'll try to take specific components and make sure they're fully redundant, and then others they'll try to just do an M plus one or M plus two. Um, some examples of different distribution systems you'll see with uh, mission critical data centers. Um, a paralleled system, this is where there would be generators connected to a parallel bus, uh, a common bus. Most of the time you'll see an M plus one, M plus two, so that if you lose one um, generator, there's a redundant generator to pick up. Or if you have one out for maintenance for an extended period of time, you have an additional generator um, just in case. Uh, these systems typically, they're paralleling switch gear. Um, more recently, you're starting to see a lot of more of onboard controls, where the paralleling control is actually with the generator, and then it has a contact that basically connects to a connector bus. Um, it kind of eliminates the need for a paralleling switch gear. It comes right with the generator. Um, the big benefit of a paralleled system uh, is maximizing utilization. It allows you to share the load without having to purchase additional generators. So if you have blocks of load that are you know, underloaded, um, you don't have to buy a whole new generator. You can kind of share the load between the two. Uh, one of the negatives to a parallel system is basically that generator bus, that parallel bus, becomes a single point of failure. Um, so recently what we've seen is we've been trying to split that bus into two. Um, on a data center we did recently, we were able to, because data centers use a lot of free cooling, a lot of times during the year they don't need as much load. The load is a little bit lower. Um, we were able to split that into basically a two-end system, and then that one month a year when we have peak heating and peak cooling, we'd close the tie and we use an M plus one system. So it's just a way to kind of help protect against that single point of failure. Another type of system uh, is an isolated redundant system. This is where you have a dedicated generator assigned to a block of load, and then you'll have one additional generator that is isolated from the other that can be used as a backup for any of the primary generators. Um, it, this basically eliminates this common point of failure. Um, it's basically easily expandable as you go. You just keep adding generators and connect it to that isolated redundant one. Um, the difficulty here is that it's tough to share load. So if you have a generator dedicated to one block of load and it's lightly loaded, it's a little more difficult to share that load with other systems. Uh, the third is a distributed redundant system. Again, this uses a dedicated generator to a block of load, but what it does is it builds in the redundancy to the other systems. So your A system would then fail to your B and C system. Um, it eliminates the common points of failure. It does reduce costs. Uh, the big problem with this is it's flexible to a point as you start getting to four generators. Uh, with three is also known as commonly known as maybe three to make two. Um, you can, I've seen three to make four, or four to make three, but as you get higher, higher, um, it gets really difficult to manage load, so it's only flexible to a point. Some of the other things, uh, design considerations, um, because data centers are, a, a, you know, a large electrical load, um, using middle, medium voltage generators, 15 kV, 4160, trying to get that transformation closer to the load um, is a good option. You can see on on the right there is just a, an example of what a 2000 kW load would look like um, from a 480 standpoint versus a 13.2. So if you're running underground with feeders, you have to upsize for impacity reasons for the heating. Uh, you know, you could be looking at 11 sets of, of feeders versus one set at 13.2. So it's a huge cost savings to go to 15 kV. Another issue, as Scott had mentioned, a lot of ATS functions with a hospital and some things like that. Because of the amounts of load and because you're picking up the entire building, you tend to see a lot more breaker interlocks um, versus ATSs where, you know, the main and the utility generator and utility breaker are kind of create that ATS. Um, also with data centers, the cooling becomes an issue as you're trying to cool the space. Um, going to generator and then coming back, a lot of times you want to do closed transitions, so synchronizing with utility so you don't have that outage when you go back from generator to utility. All those schemes, obviously, you have protective relaying scheme, differential protection, things of that nature that you need to address. Um, and again, because it is a 
it's basically a smart system. You'll have PLC controls, and you'll make sure you have redundancies in the PLCs and so forth. So again, so you don't lose one component and you lose the entire system. Another thing to look at is um, indoor or walk-in enclosures. Again, because these are critical to the operation of the facility, if you had a problem during a snowstorm or so forth, you want to be able to work on that in, in, a, in an environment where it's you know, able to work on it versus being outside in the, in the elements. So a lot of times you'll see indoor plants or at minimum at least walk-in enclosures. And then just different types of fuel systems. Um, a lot of times you'll see filters, um, cleaning systems, um, just ways to be able to move fuel from one system to another, maybe common header system, or maybe even you know common fill points. Another thing we run into is the emission requirements uh, for mission critical, um, especially in data centers, where the EPA Tier 4 requirements may include some type of after treatment, uh, such as a cat catalytic reduction, SERs, particulate filters. Um, basically, if the engines run any time during normal operation when utility is available, they're going to require a Tier 4. So if you're doing peak shaving or so forth, you're going to require that um, extra requirements. If it's only used for emergency applications, then they are not required to, to meet Tier 4. Um, there is one exemption that allows you to operate the generator for 100 hours uh, for maintenance and still fall under the Tier 4. Um, a lot of data centers or mission critical facilities, they like to do maintenance uh, of UPS systems and certain other systems on generator. So that's something when you get into design to really figure out how much time they're going to be using for maintenance because if it goes over that 100 hours a year, it will be required to have the SCRs and you just want to make sure that you have the space and the capabilities to add that or if you need to in the design. Um, as far as the different ratings, uh, I saw some questions about different ratings of systems. So the ISO has uh, ratings and performance uh, requirements. So basically, a standby engine uh, by their standards, a maximum of 200 hours a year. Um, basically, the allowable average output over a 24 hour period is 70% of its rating, and it does not have overload. So, if you, like with a data center where you'll see um, engines that may have to run for weeks because it's trying to maintain the system during the whole outage. That 70% rating can be an issue, so you might need to derate the engine. Um, the prime rating is unlimited hours. Again, it has a 24-hour period at 70%, but it does have overload. So a lot of times you'll see, instead of standby rating, you'll see a prime, prime, prime rating being used for data centers um, just because of that reason, because you're going to have a constant load over a long period of time. Uh, the other rating is continuous. Um, this is maximum power continuously, unlimited number of days. Uh, this might be a mining operation or something like that where you're going to be running without utility. Again, like I said, because uh, Tier 3, Tier 4, the runtime and the output um, a lot of times will not allow you to use the standby rating generators. We'll start looking at the prime rating. A lot of engine manufacturers now have what they call a mission critical rating. Um, it's basically 500 hours per year, but the average becomes 85%. And this is basically based on the fact that these are constant loads. They're not going to swing. They're not going to go up and down. Um, and you're going to have a constant load over a, a certain amount of time. So they've adjusted the rating of the engine. So that's something you can look into. So we talked, uh, and Scott talked, and we both had talked about um, you know, some requirements, some of the lessons learned we've had um, you know, over the last couple of Sandy, we had some floods in the south and floods out west. Um, one of the lessons learned is just to make sure the equipment is above the floodplain. I mean, if it's underwater, it's not going to run. Um, we did see with Hurricane Sandy and even some of the floods out west and the south go over a 100-year flood. So we would even recommend going as close as you could to the 500-year flood um, plane to make sure you get that equipment up out of the water. Another one that we saw a lot of is you know, we talked about fuel capacity and having adequate fuel supply. Um, even though the water did subside in a day or two, it was all the debris and stuff made it very difficult to get to certain areas. So having that extra fuel on site, the ability to have 72 hours or so to keep those facilities running. Uh, we had facilities running for a week, and um, so it's just a really take a look at how much fuel you can have. I know a lot of people say we have, you know, contracts in place to get fuel, but if they can't get there, that contract is, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. Um, another thing we did see was the fuel that, by the time the fuel got there, 
it was basically bottom of the barrel. It was really dirty fuel, had a lot of particulates in it. Filters were, you know, getting filled up really quick. So having a way to replace filters is a big uh, benefit also to do. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have any lessons learned or if you want to finish this out. No, Ken, I think those are good examples. Um, kind of in summary, what we've been talking about, move this slide here. Obviously, is the uh, emergency and legally required loads, uh, as well as the critical operations and mission critical type facility loads. Uh, these are all code required. Uh, I mentioned, and Ken talked a little bit as well about some optional loads and things that the facility or an operator might want to have on that doesn't fall into the category from a code requirement. But depending on the facility type, whether it's a hospital, healthcare facility, or mission uh, critical COPS type facility, you have your se separation of load types, so your emergency and legally required loads. Those, again, are really designed to safely evacuate people and prevent hazards uh, to get people out of the building uh, in the case of uh, normal utility loss of power. In the healthcare arena, obviously, you want to continue to maintain uh, patient care functionality uh, and ensure uh, the patient uh, will continue to, uh, you know, to be supported in the effort that it needs to with, with the equipment that, that are there uh, at the bedside or in the procedure room where the patient might be. Critical operations center, uh, these are, a lot of these are business continuity type of functions as Ken went into uh, detail on and the desire to keep that system or that entire facility up and running uh, in the event of an extended outage so that from a business continuity standpoint, uh, things continue to operate and function as uh, it would, would in any normal condition. The overarching goal here obviously is that the generator and the standby power systems are to provide power when there's a loss of utility. Mission critical facilities, uh, regardless of the type, uh, have a required requirement to remain operational under all conditions. And uh, Ken alluded to the Sandy uh, uh, Sandy uh, incident a uh, number of years ago and, and the, the impact that that had on any number of facilities and, and how they dealt with that is something that obviously wants to be planned for. The generator and the standby power systems uh, in the mission critical facility require a higher level of reliability and availability. And this is obviously something that, regardless of the facility type, when you step into the project, you want to make sure that you sit down with the end users and the owner and walk through what their requirements and expectations are so that as the planning and the design process proceeds, that you're meeting the expectations of those users. Uh, clearly, and obviously, you also need to uh, align with code and what the, the local AHJs will require and uh, continue to advance your design and progress your design, uh, kind of really gathering all of those bits and pieces together. There's no one right answer for, for any and all facility types. Uh, each and every owner that I've ever worked with generally has their own unique requirements and desires. Uh, so you want to understand those as you move in and along through the process. And with that, I will turn it back to Jack. Okay, thank you, Kenneth and Scott, for that terrific presentation. And now our presenters will answer questions about this topic. So type your questions in the Ask a Question box on your screen, and please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing his name before the question. And if you are on Twitter, tweet your questions to hashtag CSE Critical Power. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. <coughs> Additional information will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of the webcast. And to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES learning unit certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. And the exam will open a new browser window and you can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website at www.csemag.com with the on-demand version of the webcast. Now let's take some questions. 
That's okay, Scott. Let's uh, first question. Um, you get the first question. Uh, okay. You're talking about optional load. Mm -hmm. uh, so is the optional load on a separate uh, ATS? It doesn't need to be, but obviously I think that would be a preferred, or generally a preferred route to, to, to proceed with. Uh, the thing to keep in mind with an optional load, given that it is not a required load from a code perspective, you need the ability to shed that load if you need to dump load off of your system. And obviously the easiest way to do that is generally uh, tying it to a separate transfer switch that uh, serves just optional loads. Um, and it has to be separated or segregated uh, from the life safety and the critical care loads uh, at a minimum. Thank you. Good answer. So I guess the uh, engineering answer is it depends. It depends. Highly, highly recommended, yes. Okay, Ken, you get the next question. This is a good one because this is a hot topic lately. Uh, is selective coordination required in the latest code down to 0 0.1 seconds? Yeah, so on, on the, I guess there's two, I guess three pieces, but the first piece to, on the emergency side, yes. To, I mean, selective coordination in the code doesn't really dis discriminate against point one. Point one below point one is really the instantaneous region. For cops, um, it just says selective coordination. It doesn't it doesn't identify 0.1 seconds. Now we've had that discussion, and I recommend if you get into COPS to have that discussion early with your AHJ just to make sure. A lot of AHJs do take it down to the one second and don't require coordination in the instantaneous range, um, but some of them still do. So that's something you want to make sure you identify early in the project. Um, on the emergency side for generators, you know, in an emergency mode, yes, it's still required uh, selective coordination. On the optional standby, there is no selective coordination requirement. Um, again, it's not as a code as it would be with hospital or with uh, 708 mission critical. So it's just something to be looking at which, which type of system you're using. Thanks, Ken. So Scott, you get the next question. If your elevator is required to be on an emer on emergency power, is the elevator in hospitals required to be on the life safety, critical, or equipment branch? Sure, good question. Uh, there's really two parts to that. So the lighting that's in the elevator cab is required to be on the life safety branch. The elevator motor itself uh, is on an equipment branch. Typically what I'll do, because you'll have a bank of elevators, um, and oftentimes given how the distribution system works out, it makes a lot of sense to have all of the elevators in that bank or in the facility on a separate transfer switch, uh, separate from other equipment loads. It just helps to allow for easier control in the load shedding uh, sequencing that we talked about earlier. Hey, thanks, Scott. Okay, Ken, I'll give you an easy one. But um, I guess some people don't know because they ask the question. So what is N and what is N plus one? Yeah, I guess I, I guess I need to elaborate on that. So basically N is what they call need. So it's basically to meet the need of, of your load. So you basically have the generator's uh, size to meet the need of your load. And then N plus one is need plus an additional one. So if you need three generators to meet the load, N plus N would be three, N plus one would be four. So you have the three to meet the load plus an additional one should any of those fail or you need to take one out for maintenance. Moving right along to the next question for you, Scott. So what role do UPS systems play, and what are the design considerations for employing them in healthcare facilities? You're saying that could, you that, sure that could be a touchy one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, we're seeing UPSs coming into play in healthcare facilities in in a number of different arenas. Obviously, with the heavier reliance on IT and computer systems. There's clearly a need there to keep those uh, systems and those pieces of equipment up and running and functional throughout. 
Uh, and obviously, because they're computer-based, they can't uh, accept that 10-second, potentially 10-second blip while you're transitioning from normal to generator power. So that's one area where we're seeing a lot of UPSs deployed. Uh, the other is on the on the with the imaging and radiology equipment. Again, since those equipment or pieces of equipment are generally computer operated and computer controlled, uh, we're seeing many hospitals, many institutions backing up those systems on UPS power as well, uh, because they're uh, it's so critical to the ongoing patient care environment. Even a, a little potential loss of power. Uh, even for a few seconds, may require them to completely reboot and reset those systems, which, depending on the nature and the sophistication of the equipment, could be quite lengthy, uh, half an hour to an hour worth of time. And when there's a great need for that piece of diagnostic equipment, that's just too long of a period of time for them to be without power or without that piece of equipment. Um, the other thing that we are seeing as it relates to UPSs uh, is the use of rotary UPSs in lieu of battery in all instances. Again, since we're only looking to maintain a short period of time, and this is particularly on the radiology and imaging systems, uh, employing uh, rotary UPSs in lieu of battery for the benefits that those have in regards to space, uh, lack of requirement for cooling or reduced requirement for cooling and ventilation. Um, so those are areas and things that we see on the UPS front in healthcare. Okay, Ken, got another easy one for you, but you touched on this a little bit earlier, but maybe a little bit more elaboration. Could you please discuss uh, some commissioning requirements? Yeah, I mean, the overall, you know, for a standby power system, you want to make sure when it needs to function, it is going to function. So to commission the generator and so forth uh, is an important role. You know, test it, make sure it meets load, make sure it's startup, make sure, it, you know, timing requirements. But in addition to that, you also want to test the rest of the systems. Um, a lot of times, uh, just recently I was called into a, a facility that had a failure and it was, you know, the first thing you ask is, was the system commissioned? And they talk about, yep, the generator was commissioned, the UPS was commissioned, the switchgear was commissioned, and they did a pull the plug, so in their mind, everything was commissioned. But it was a two-end system, so there's a lot of failure sequences, so you want to make sure you go through all the sequences, any possible combination of the test that during the commissioning process to make sure it's going to work. Um, basically, what they found out is one of the, in the, uh, STS, they have a uh, restraint on the STS that was turned off, and it, a simple commissioning would have been able, during the testing, would have saw that. They would have been able to turn it on. It would have saved them during the failure. So it is very important to go through, you know, commissioning process, make sure you commission not only the generator, but all the components as a system. So I think that's very important. Okay, Scott, would you like to add to that? For uh, commissioning, uh, as it applies to healthcare facilities, anything you want to chime in there on? No, uh, not generally. I mean, the it, what I've noticed is every AHJ has very different specific requirements. Um, so again, having that early conversation and understanding what what's kind of on their hit list of things would be uh, would be very important and recommended. And even, okay. even importance, like Scott said, we, we run into some cop. They actually want to witness a lot of the times the, the, the mm -hmm. actual commissioning or operation, so that's important to get in, to make sure that's part of the schedule. And Scott, you're not going to get off the hook that easy. I'll we'll give you okay. another question here. What are some common load shedding strategies? Common strategies oftentimes uh, I'll utilize or rely on transfer switches. Um, I've also seen facilities where they've utilized um, shunt chip circuit breakers. Um, it, that becomes a little bit more challenging in the sense that uh, it's less flexible as things change and evolve over time. Uh, those kinds of systems uh, were often employed uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And as you're going in now and, and retrofitting and changing the the facilities, um, it's becoming more problematic, or it is more pro, excuse me, more problematic to change those. My preference is to rely on the transfer switches, uh, as I was talking about earlier, to be the main focus or the main point of your load shed load control system. 
Okay, we have time for one more question. And so, Ken, you get it. And what are some pros and cons of diesel versus natural gas generators? So basically, diesel and the difference, the main, you know, a lot of the main differences between diesel and natural gas. A diesel accepts step loads bigger, so it'll take a bigger step load than natural gas. Diesels tend to start faster. Um, natural gas takes a little bit of time. Natural gases are uh, usually are larger uh, in size, so that's a that's a requirement. Um, the benefits of natural gas, obviously, are emissions. You can, if if the source is good. Um, you could run for a long period of time on, on natural gas. The negative side of that is you're relying on an outside source, so if the, the the pressure station or something happened to that line, you would lose the fuel source for that system. Um, so we're still seeing a lot of diesel um, on the data center side just because of the, the reliability. And the, the, but um, as emissions become more and more popular, we start to see natural gas. Um, there are some combo generators that will use diesel to start um, and then move to natural gas, so that's an option. Um, they're not; those systems are relatively small right now. They are getting larger, but um, it is an option. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we don't see them on the data center as much. Uh, maybe some of the smaller sites um, that don't have a big impact, we will see them just because of the fuel source. So it all really depends. But those are probably the most differences that I would that I would see. Good answer. Hey, I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Kenneth Katsmita and Scott Kessler, for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge and their expertise. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsors, ASCO Power Technologies, for supporting today's webcast. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, Thanks for attending the webcast. And this now concludes our program. Thank you and goodbye.